Good evening, everyone. I'm Osama B. Murshid, Director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, and I want to welcome you to the Oberoi Distinguished Roundtable. This public event is sponsored by the Oberoi Family Foundation, and I'm delighted that uh, Mr. Alok Oberoi was able to be with us tonight, and I thank him for his support of the Center's public activities and for his support for this evening's Distinguished Roundtable. Now, it's always my distinct pleasure to meet and interact with colleagues whose works I greatly admire, and tonight's event brings together four of them. Professors Desai, Green, and Yang are among the most eminent scholars in the field we may be inappropriately labeling Indian Ocean Studies, inappropriately because it surely fails to contain the full scope of their research and analyses. It is, however, perfectly appropriate to describe their works as pioneering and seminal, as their contributions have advanced in significant and innovative ways our understanding of and appreciation for the intricate histories that make up the Indian Ocean world. Just to introduce them individually, but you have their bios in your program. Professor Gaurav Desai is a professor of English in the program of African and African African and African Diaspora Studies at Tulane University. He's the author of Subject to Colonialism, African Self-Fashioning and the Colonial Library, and is editor of Teaching the African Novel. He was the recipient of a National Humanities Center Fellowship in 2001, and has been granted a Rockefeller Foundation Award for residency at the Bellagio Center in Italy. In 2004, Professor Desai was made a life member of Clare Hall in Cambridge University. His latest book on narratives of Indian Ocean connections between Africa and India is entitled Commerce with the Universe, Africa, India, and the Afrasian Imagination. And it was published in 2013 by Columbia University Press. Dr. Niall Green is professor of history at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is primarily a historian of the Muslim communities of South Asia, India, and Pakistan from the 18th to early 20th centuries and he specializes in the wi wider Persianate world, including Afghanistan, Iran, and the Indian Ocean region. He's a historian of religion by training and the author of several books. He has worked extensively on the history of Sufism and other traditional modes of Islamic learning and organization, as well as on topics ranging from the forms of Islam that evolved among the tribal societies of early modern Afghans to the intersection of religion and colonial service among the Muslim soldiers of the British Empire. And more recently, he has expanded his research into 19th century intellectual interchange between Asia and Europe, Muslim travelers in Britain, Indian Ocean Studies, and the history of the Islamic book. Dr. Anand Young is professor of international studies and history at the University of Washington, Seattle. Between 2002 and 2010, he was director of the Henry Jackson School of International Studies and the Gullup Chair of International Studies. Professor Yang received his BA from Swarthmore College and his PhD in history from the University of Virginia. His publications include The Limited Raj, Agrarian Relations in Colonial India, and Bazaar India, Peasants, Traders, Markets, and the Colonial State in Gangetic Bihar. He's also uh, editor of the volume Crime and Criminality in British India, and of numerous articles in journals of Asian studies, history, and the social sciences. Currently, he's working on book projects exploring coerced Indian labor in Southeast Asia and Chinese and South Asian labor migrations across the globe in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I want to welcome all of you to our center and to tell you that I am not speaking for myself when I say we're all looking forward to your presentations this evening. I'm equally delighted to introduce our no less distinguished moderator uh, for the evening, my colleague and friend, Dr. Paula Newberg. Dr. Newberg teaches politics, public policy, and Asian studies at the University of Texas, Austin, where she is clinical professor and fellow of the Wilson Chair in Pakistan Studies. Her work focuses on the intersections between human rights, democratic governance, and foreign policy in crisis and transi transition states and regions. She is a scholar and practitioner with wide-ranging experience in multilateral and non-governmental organizations and has served as special advisor to United Nations in Asia, Europe, and Africa. She's also written extensively on constitutional development, jurisprudence, rights, and governance in South and Central Asia. Her publications include monographs on courts and politics in Pakistan, 
on insurgency in Kashmir and complex emergency in Afghanistan. She's also authored two edited volumes on telecommunications policy, as well as one edited volume on human rights. Dr. Newberg was also senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she co-founded its Democracy Project and was a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. And as some of you know, prior to moving to Austin, Paula was director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy here at Georgia University, and I remember warning her distinctly that I would find every opportunity to bring her back to Georgetown, and I am thankful that she accepted the invitation. So I want to thank you all again to, for being with us tonight, and it's now my pleasure to hand it over to Paula. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, can you hear us all from in the back? Great. Um, we thought what we'd do is have each of the speakers give a reasonably shaped and timed presentation, um, then take a break, and then come back for a discussion among them, and then open for questions. And I think we're going not quite in the order in which they're seated. So we'll start with Gorov, continue with Nile, and then end with Anand. There's a person over there who's going to tell you if you're close to time. So, Gaurav, why don't we begin? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Osama Abhimeshed and the uh, S Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and all the colleagues here uh, for inviting me. I'm very grateful and honored, um, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. So, one of the tricky things about doing a presentation like this with, where the papers are circulated but might not have gotten to everybody in the room uh, is that one can never quite sh be sure as to how much uh, knowledge you have of the, pre of the material that I'm presenting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow myself about five minutes to just introduce you to the autobiography that I'm going to be talking on. I'll do that by, uh, with a short reading just to contextualize the text. And then I'll just talk about some of the, the reasons why I'm interested in it, how it works for me uh, in the classroom in particular uh, as a pedagogical uh, text. So here goes. The title of my project, Frail Skiffs Tossed on the Ocean of Life, comes from a remarkable autobiography written by the 19th century Zanzibari princess, Saida Salme. Salme was born on August 30th, 1844, as the daughter of the Sultan of Zanzibar, Syed Said. Her mother was a Circassian slave who was acquired by the Sultan as a young girl and who had subsequently become one of his sarari concubines. Um, Same grew up in, uh, in both the rural and urban palaces of the Sultan and was in Stone Town when he left to go to Oman to help his elder son Tueni uh, defend himself against an attack from his Persian neighbors. In his absence, Zanzibar was at first ruled by Khalid, uh, the eldest brother on the island, but by the time of Said's death on his way back from Oman, Khalid too had died and Majid had become the Sultan. The cholera epidemic uh, that hit Zanzibar in 1858-1859 claimed the life of Salme's mother, leaving her an orphan at a young age. Salme was living at this point with her sister Kole, to whom she was quite devoted, and who involved her in a conspiracy against their brother Majid, instigated by their brother Bargash, who, who was seeking the throne. The conspiracy was squashed by Majid. Bargash was sent in ex into exile to Bombay, uh, where he stayed for two years, and then he quietly returned to Zanzibar to await his turn for the Sultanate. Uh, upon Majid's death in 1870, Bargash took over the Sultanate. And in the meantime, Salme had met a young German merchant, Heinrich Ruite, uh, who was her next door neighbor. And they developed a romance that resulted in a pregnancy which could not be socially sanctioned. Assisted by the wife of the British vice consul, Salme f fled to Aden in 1866 to await her fiancé. There she was baptized into the Anglican church and given the name, uh, Christian name Emily. Upon her marriage with Heinrich, she was known by, by her Christian name, Emily Ruete. Uh, while Rueta never mentions her Zanzibari pregnancy, nor the child resulting from it in any of her writings, E. Van Donzel, a scholar who has studied her life in some detail, suggests that a child was born to her in Aden on December 7, 1866, and baptized on April 1, 1867, with the name of Heinrich. This boy presumably died before the couple reached Europe, since there's no mention or trace of him there. Emily subsequently had three children with Heinrich, Anthony, Said, uh, and Rosalie. Uh, but tragedy soon hit, hit their family because as their young house, uh, in their young household because her husband soon died in a tram accident in 1870. 
So Emily found herself a widow uh, with three children and discovered that much of Heinrich's estate uh, had either been misappropriated by his business partners or otherwise poorly invested in bonds that provided low returns. For much of her life, Emily moved from town to town in Germany in search of the most economical arrangement for her family's maintenance and struggled to obtain the remainder of her inheritance from her brother Bargash, who, had, who was now you know, the, the sultan. She used her position as a German subject to enlist the support of German authorities to make her claims for her inheritance. And traveled, and traveled to England in 1875 during Bargash's much anticipated metropolitan visit in order to represent herself uh, to him in person, but was prevented from doing so uh, by Sir Bartle Frere, who basically tried to uh, bribe her. She, he basically tried to say that if he, she stayed away from her brother, he would take care, or the British government would take care of the needs of her children as they were growing up. And so it was too, too good of a deal for her to pass up on, and so she agreed to, to, um, to not meet with her brother. Um, and of course, uh, as the story has it, the British reneged on the claim and she you know, was ultimately betrayed by them. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, she, uh, she, the, uh, the reason her brother didn't want to give her her inheritance was because she had lost it, uh, he claimed, because went after she had converted to Christianity. Um, and her struggles with her faith, the meaning of her con conversion, and her attempts to make sense of her displacement are a central part of her, of her, of her life, life story. Uh, her ultimately futile visits to Zanzibar in 1885 and 1888 in pursuit of her inheritance and her sense of betrayal by her brother Bargash, by England, and by Germany have a tragically poetic quality to them. Indeed, Oscar Wilde, who reviewed her memoirs when they were first published in, in English translation in 1888, noted, the princess is herself a woman of high culture, and the story of her life is as instructive as history and as fascinating as fiction. Her, her autobiography was very well received in Europe and translated several times uh, and pr reprinted several times uh, when it first came out. Uh, and we can talk about that a little uh, later. Um, since uh, you know the the, the uh, since she published that book, she also had uh, she also wrote um, uh, a a German text called Letters Home that was not uh, actually published until recently in English. Uh, it was addressed to a dear friend, and she also but but it's it's debatable whether this was a real text written to a to a dear friend back home because it was written in the German language as opposed to Arabic. Um, but um, uh, and she also wrote a book on Syrian cust Syrian customs. Um, uh, uh, which she had actually um, uh, based on ethnographic work that she did in Syria. Um, so what I want to suggest is that her story is a fascinating um, case study of the culture and politics of transregional identities in a world caught between a Zanzibari monarchy and the arrival of British and German colonialism in the East African Indian Ocean. The characters in the story move between various Indian Ocean ports in Zanzibar, Aden, Oman, and Bombay, and Salme herself moves between Zanzibar, Germany, England, and Syria. Her story is at once one of relative subalternity to her more powerful brothers, but also one in which she can manipulate the competitive colonial rivalries between the Germans and the British to work for her own benefit. Hers is a tale of a cross-racial romance in a world of a racially coded colonialism. It is also a tale of the intimacies of the project of slave emancipation and the encroachment of British colonialism. So just, as, just to give you a sense of who Salme is and, and what this text is about, the autobiography was essentially written uh, in German uh, for primarily a German uh, audience, but it was then translated, as I suggested, in English and other languages languages, um, and it was written to make money. She was literally in Germany as a single mom trying to find every means possible to, to you know, earn a living, to, to, to feed her kids. She tutored in Arabic. She, she uh, offered herself as a tutor of Arabic to various people. She wrote this thing, uh, uh, you know, to, and she got, indeed got some royalties out of it, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's an interesting exercise intellectually for us because what she does in there uh, is she tries to, in some ways, explain, um, you know, Zanzibar and Arabic. Arab, uh, Arabic, Omani Arab customs in Zanzibar to a Western audience. And her project is really a project of what we might think of today as a critique of Orientalism. Um, I mean, and especially uh, the Orientalist reading of things like the Eastern woman. She has a, a, a chapter in the book called The Position of Women in the East, in which she basically tries to refute all the stereotypes of the passivity of the Arabic woman and the, you know, the uh, ways in which patriarchy works and, you know, the, the whole notion 
of polygamy and the way in which it is constructed. Um, uh, she, she tries to present, you know, a kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, non-Western, if you will, uh, uh, you know, Omani perspective. And then she critiques German society and European values. Um, for instance, I'll give you one example. She, she tries to point to certain hypocrisy. She talks about how, you know, the only difference between, uh, you know, a polygamous household and, and, uh, and a European one is that, you know, in the polygamous household, at least the women, women uh, she says, uh, know and can identify their, you know, their competitors, whereas in Europe, you know, this, uh, you know, it's largely left uh, uh, unknown or unspoken. Uh, so, you know, she, she, she has these various ways of, um, you know, doing this comparativist uh, critique, if you will. Uh, I find this text a very interesting one to teach in classrooms because it really, students are really confronted by a different by certain dissonances, right? So on the one hand, her text reads as a very proto-feminist text, if you will, right? She's uh, talking about uh, women's agency. She herself is writing in a context in which women are not allowed to, to write. You know, women were, were encouraged to read the Quran, but not write. And so she's actually defying, you know, her family by actually secretly learning how to write. Um, uh, and of course, she's been a rebel in other ways, as we, as we already talked about. So she herself is a woman who, who, with a lot of agency. And she, you know, speaks about that, and she, you know, she calls on other women in her family and and in, you know, in the uh, in the society at large, who she shows as, you know, strong women. So in, in many ways, it's a very proto-feminist narrative, and students are all excited to see this early um, narrative, um, you know, uh, taking that stance. At the same time, they are troubled by the fact that that she has what we might we certainly think of today as very problematic um, attitudes towards uh, issues of race. Um, she doesn't have very good things to say about black folks. Um, you know, she has cert very clearly uh, a sense of civilizational superiority over black Africans, and that comes across very directly in the, in the text, uh, five minutes left, yeah. So students struggle with it, and uh, rather than, uh, because you know, even if, when I teach them more, more contemporary post-colonial narratives, right, uh, which, which might be feminist narratives, they oftentimes, the feminism goes hand in hand with an anti-racist stance, right? So uh, they are progressive narratives that look at all kinds of intersectionalities and try to work against them. Here's a text that is, on the one hand, very progressive. On the, one ha on the other hand, uh, they don't quite know what to do with its kind of discourse of race. Now, rather than running away from it, I find this a very useful thing in the classroom because students are confronted with what it means to have a certain kind of constellations of political belief working together or working at odds with each other. Um, uh, so, so that's one of the things uh, that I find you know, very pr provocative about this. this. There's a long discussion of slavery in, the, of this, in this text as well. And here again, students have a difficulty um, you know, confronting it because she is very much a pro-slavery advocate. Right, so uh, she, uh, of course, we've had, as you know, those of you, those of us who have studied uh, Indian Ocean s societies and dis have discussions of slavery. Of course, we've had these discussions about the differences between Atlantic slave uh, societies uh, and Indian Ocean ones, and some of that is pr is present in her um, in her text, and we talk about that in in the context of the classroom. But at the same time, we don't want to excuse away Indian Ocean slavery as somehow just because it's not quite the same as Atlantic slavery, it's it's somehow okay. It's not okay. And so students have to confront that and deal with it and, and try to understand that historically. Uh, and I find that, it, that this text allows them to do that. And it also allows them to think about these trans-regional maps. One of the things I, uh, I, I did some work in the Maharashtra State Archives in Bombay, uh, and it's fascinating to see the, uh, the uh, uh, council uh, in Aden uh, writing to the Bombay presidency when, when Ruete is on her way to, um, uh, to Germany. And Bargash is trying to put pressure on Aden to send her back. He wants his sister back. He doesn't want her to, to elope with this guy. Um, and uh, the Aden guy, the, the people in Aden are writing to the Bombay presidency saying, what do we do? What, how do, do we give her money? Do we support her? Do we, do we let her go to Germany? Do we send her back? What, you know? So this kind of, it's very interesting that really more of the politics, and of course historians have told us this, uh, Thomas Metcalf and, and so many others have told us this, that, that Zanzibar becomes more of a concern for India than it really does for the metropole, right? Uh, and and, and is really managed, if you will, for, by, by the British, uh, you know, in, in those quarters. So that's another discussion that, that's a very interesting one to have. Bargash's own life in Bombay is also quite interesting because as, as, as many folks have noticed, um, the encounter with a certain kind of colonial modernity that Bargash has in metropolitan Bombay carries over with him 
to, to Zanzibar, and when he becomes um, the Sultan, he um, begins to enact all, all kinds of modernization projects and you know building buildings and uh, uh, stuff like that. So those those again Indian Ocean discussions are are very productive and fruitful to have in the context of um, uh, of this text. But I probably have run out of time, and I know we'll have plenty. Of the, there's a lot more in this paper. This is a very much of an early paper. I'm still thinking through this text. There's a lot more that we can talk about. But I just wanted to throw out some of the, the reasons why I find it an interesting text. Yeah. Over to me. Well, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with you this evening, and I'm grateful also, of course, to Dr. Abi Meshed for the, in, for the invitation and to the Obori Family Foundation for their support. My thanks also to Tarek and Susan for all of their hard logistical work. Well, I'll be talking today about um, uh, um, a project that really has sort of come to me bit by bit over the years of working with a range of different um, primary materials coming from the Indian Ocean, in particular uh, travel writings, and trying to think about these uh, travelogues uh, in... Um, in perhaps a different way, in reflection to an emergent historiography. Now, of course, as many of us know, the, the field of Indian Ocean studies emerged in the 1970s, particularly the 1980s, really out of economic history, early modern economic history and colonial economic history with the works of Kane Chowdhury and Ashin Das Gupta. What I'm interested in doing with uh, this project is trying to move away from that early historiography, and indeed as it's moved into a more recent cultural turn, to questions in global history, and particularly um, a recent set of conversations initiated with uh, a significant edited volume by Moyen and Sartori, Global Intellectual History. And I'd like to bring together Indian Ocean history with, with uh, these new questions of how do we write a global intellectual history, an intellectual history that is truly global. I think what's really important for that, if there is to be such a thing, an, an Indian Ocean intellectual history, and indeed a global intellectual history more generally, we need to be looking at indigenous and vernacular actors. And indeed, as a, a sort of a former, indeed, a kind of a still kind of card-carrying subalternist, I'm very interested in trying to write an intellectual history in some ways from the bottom up. And indeed, an intellectual history that doesn't necessarily have intellectuals in it. People who perhaps wrote text or whose, whose ideas were recorded in text, but wouldn't necessarily fit with the classic idea of the, of the intellectual as it emerges, of course, in the 19th century European thought. The Indian Ocean, of course, presents uh, particular problems in, in, in such a venture, not least because, of course, we have such a cacophony of languages, and particularly by the 19th century, such a a range of languages which, and vernaculars which start to be written down. But nonetheless, I think it's those vernacular sources that need to lay the foundations for any intellectual history for the Indian Ocean. And if indeed it's meant to be an intellectual history that is yet somehow oceanic, I think there needs to be an oceanic component, not just from countries that happen to have the ocean washing upon their shores. And for that reason, I'll be looking today at, at in particular about travel writings, because I think travel writings that indeed involve an oceanic crossing, at least for me, satisfy that criteria of being somehow inherently oceanic. And I'm interested in this period of the 19th century when steam travel, both over land and over sea, um, and vernacular printing, printing in the languages around the Indian Ocean, create what I've called in, another, in an edited volume, the age of steam and print. When... Of course, it's only in the 19th century, really in the middle of the 19th century, that we effectively start to see for the first time vernacular languages being printed um, around the Indian Ocean, particularly, of course, uh, Muslim languages that, uh, that I'm interested in. So um, hold tight, because I'm now going to uh, move through something of a tour d'horizon of the Indian Ocean with looking at a number of these texts that emerge from this period of the age of steam and print, when vernacular printing coincides with steam travel, industrial travel, to put far more people of different types of background on the move across the Indian Ocean. This is, of course, the period of the 19th and early 20th century, the great period of Indian Ocean as well, and indeed larger than Atlantic migration. And, of course, more and more of those actors are able to record and indeed print and leave a legacy of their thoughts and reflections upon those movements through a movement towards vernacular printing uh, and, indeed, vernacular writing, vernacularization more generally. 
So, of course, then this is the period, of course, that there is a, in some senses, an important colonial infrastructural element to what I'm talking about. But nonetheless, in many ways, we're talking about commercial rather than necessarily controlled travel. This is an era, of course, before the invention of the passport. So it's a much more freewheeling and an open economy of travel, particularly for, let's say, third-class travel, than we might think of. The first example I want to uh, bring to your attention, then, is an example of what I've called these old routes. We'll be looking, I'll be looking today at old routes across the Indian Ocean and newer routes that emerge <coughs> during this period of expansive steam travel networks. Mohammed Hussein Azad, um, a book collector, a colonial um, bureaucrat, and a figure who in 1885 makes a very old journey across the Indian Ocean from India to Iran, but with a new kind of intellectual aim of collecting manuscripts, collecting the code ecological heritage of those earlier Indo-Persian literary connections that he felt were under threat in the colonial period. He's a fascinating figure because he left behind him um, a very kind of rough and ready diary of his travels across Iran. His travels to Iran from, from Karachi by boat along the coast, very detailed accounts of these coastal towns, and then by donkey across the towns of Iran trying to collect manuscripts, as he recorded in the, the later publication of his handwritten diary that was called his Seri Iran, A Journey Through Iran. What interests me is the global context in which this is taking part. This, of course, is the period of the great manuscript collectors, and particularly the great um, oriental language collections that were coll uh, collected by European collectors, such as Konstantin von, von Tischendorf in this period, who discovers the, the Codex Sinaiticus, the oldest Bible manuscript. More relevant, perhaps, is the British orientalist E.G. Brown, who travels to Iran with exactly the same mission as Azad, only just over a um, a year later, in 1887, traveling more or less to the same places as Azad as well, also leaving a travel account too, his own travel diary that he publishes some years later. So we get in the sense of an intellectual history that is oceanic, but also has this kind of global context, I think, which is in a historicizing age, an age when not so much it was important to have the finest illuminated manuscript, which might have been part of a, a knowledge economy of an early, early modern period, but to have different original manuscripts in the sense of a historicized approach to try to collect, find the, the order text, the original edition. Brown's also interesting insofar as in Cambridge he hosted another Indian Ocean traveler, this time someone who traveled out of Iran into India. Haji Pirzadeh also left a diary, this time in Persian rather than in Urdu. He arrives the same year that Azad is going from India to Iran. Pirzadeh comes to Karachi where uh, Azad left, and on to Bombay. He's interested not so much in collecting tradition, the literary heritage of tradition, but in recording modernity. Bombay and Karachi are sites for him of the extraordinary new technologies brought about by steam power, and also the new forms of knowledge being created, a new kind of knowledge economy in some ways, not least connected to business, Iranian merchants, and of course the colonial state as well. One of the fascinating things for me about this transitional 19th century text is when we start to find new loan words from European languages appearing. In this case, office, the new institution of the office that he found fascinating, that he didn't have. He didn't want to call it a daftar, perhaps, in, a, in an older Persian word. This was something strikingly new for him. There are many other, um, let's say, much more subaltern travelers around the Indian Ocean enabled by the Hajj. These weren't intellectuals in any sense then. These were small town pilgrims traveling third class, often pauper pilgrims, as they were called in the colonial um, records of the time. And many of them, again, left um, accounts in their vernaculars, not least such as this text, the Jade Haq, the, the road of truth, the journey towards Mecca then, um, and recorded, for example, their reflections, or certainly their first-hand accounts, of things that were puzzling to them. Very often these accounts, the, the, the Hajj accounts in Persian, Urdu in, in, in other languages, in Indian Turkic from the period, bring up this puzzle that they thought they were going to the, uh, the Islamic center, the Holy Land, the Arabic-speaking regions of the world. But when they pass through the Suez Canal, opened, of course, in 1869, they find that the lingua franca of the port towns is actually French. And actually, many of the people who are living there are either Italians or French. Even when Indian Muslims who've learned Arabic land at places like Aden and try to speak in the classical Arabic they've learned, they either find that more people in Aden are speaking Hindi, 
or they find that their Arabic is unintelligible in colloquial Arabic there. So there are many of these kind of puzzles that are oceanic, but in a sense they're reflecting larger, I think, globalized issues of identity, language, and movement in the period. Moving back from Urdu to another Persian account, then we have figures like, religious figures, like Safi Ali Shah, an important uh, Sufi traveler who moves to India on the make, trying to um, establish his reputation in 1880, the similar period, and tells of rather an enchanted modernity. The travelogue that he writes tells of strange encounters in which, strange tales in which um, a telegraph is sent, of course moving at the speed of, uh, well, whatever it is, I guess the speed of, uh, I'm not sure what a telegraph speed, speed is, pretty, pretty fast, the speed of a telegraph. <laughs> but nonetheless, a yogi manages to send a message even more quickly than the telegraph. So we get this sense of overlapping of yogis and Sufis, and their miracles outdoing even the telegraph. He also wrote a collection of poems. I couldn't find a cover. This is a different one, Irfan al-Haq. But he wrote a long collection of poems, Bahr al-Haqaiq, the ocean of realities, in which he's constantly reflecting on the language of the ocean. Burma is another, period, another place, of course, of... Uh, Burma overtook... Rangoon overtook New York in the, the early 1900s as the, 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 the greatest immigration port in the world. This had its own series of vernacular texts, too. Accounts like on the left, a, a campaign history by a figure who seems to have been a former colonial soldier... Um, involved in the, the conquest of, of Burma by the East India Company and then the Raj. There are many of these other texts that start to come too, hybrid uh, multilingual texts in Burmese and Arabic, these texts of conversion texts of Indian Muslims moving out to try to convert uh, Buddhists as well. An ethnographic text in a similar way, the Seri Barma from 1893, giving a very rich ethnographic account of the religion that he calls the Mazhabi Burma, the religion of Burma. What's fascinating to me about this incredibly rich account of the religion we would call Buddhism is that the author has no concept of Buddhism. He's having to start from scratch about building up what is this religion here. He's had no interface with the colonial discovery of Buddhism in the 19th century when this, this religion and the historicity of the figure we call Buddha, he calls Gautama, has in having no idea of Buddha. Moving towards new roots then, Africa and Japan, at least new routes in many ways for new routes of parts in India, such as South Africa. Again, we have various indigenous materials there that give us a sense of oceanic languages here, an Urdu and Gujarati poster celebrating the death of a, an immigrant Indian Muslim saint in, in Durban in the early 1900s. But the large number, of course, of movement across the Indian Ocean to Africa, again reflecting my subaltern concerns, were of workers for the... Uganda Railroad and, uh, and other then lower class and middle class shopkeepers that followed the expansion of the Uganda Railway uh, inland. I've tried to do some work on uh, Urdu texts in Africa and the earliest of these texts I found was written in 1901, published in 1904, called the uh, Ugandava Mombasa, the Safanami Ugandava Mombasa, the Safanami of the travelogue of India, of Uganda and Mombasa, clearly enough. It seems to reflect in many ways what we've heard in Dr. Desai's presentation about Emily Reuter, that this was a parallel, but nonetheless uh, a parallel imperialist discourse carried out in Urdu rather than English. Many racial tropes about African peoples, many uh, celebrations of the British colonial enterprise, but nonetheless being patched on as a continuation of this earlier Islamic civilizing mission in East Africa as well. Again, another very rich... Uh, account um, ethnographically and otherwise. We have later accounts in Urdu as well that start to deal with the interactions of language. I've just thrown up here this Urdu account of Amharic, Fulani and Zulu then, so these Bantu languages of South Africa in Urdu. Moving to Japan, Japan's particularly interesting because of course in many ways it's beyond the Indian Ocean but it's the Indian Ocean commercial networks, particularly from Bombay in 1880, that join up Bombay and thereby India uh, to Yokohama and Japan more widely. And from Yokohama, like Bombay, Bombay had the first train service in Asia, Asia and Yokohama has the first train service in Japan. There were a number of, again, Persian and um, Urdu and indeed Malay, Arabic and various other uh, Islamic accounts of Japan. Again, there's a mercantile element. We get this constantly the sense of the, the mercantile foundations, perhaps, of Indian Ocean uh, mobility. In this text from 1897 of Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Sahabashi, this uh, uh, Iranian merchant traveler who gives us perhaps the, 
as far as I'm aware, the first Persian account of sushi. Mahi kham ki chub mi a raw fish that they eat with two sticks. But nonetheless, for him, Japan is a place of moral and cultural strangeness. He has no Japanese loan words. He describes this as a land of hammams, of, as it were, Middle Eastern bathhouses. And the vocabulary he constantly uses is Islamic vocabulary to describe what is clearly a Shinto Buddhist society. Only a few decades later, though, we have this uh, a very rich global travelogue, in a sense, that has a strong Indian Ocean component by Mithi Khuli Hidayat, again in Persian, that starts to show us the much vaunted cosmopolitanism of the Indian Ocean. But for me, what's interesting is this emerging as a historical process. Only seven years earlier, Sahaf Bashi from Iran has no grasp of this, what he sees as this weird and very morally problematic Japanese society in which men and their daughters-in-law go in the bathhouse together naked. This is unthinkable for him. But even a few years later, Hidayat, as part of this fascination with Japan, um, has a very different approach, using many loan words as well. I won't talk us through um, all of the other um, Indian travelers that come, but you can see again <laughs> these figures. This figure, a truly cosmopolitan, he was actually E.M. Forster's lover, and a passage to India is dedicated to Ross Masood. So here is not in his Oxford gown, but in his Shogun's gown. He wrote in English and then had to be translated into Urdu, a 400 page account of Japanese history. Many other Urdu accounts emerge in this period, but we start to get a sense of the limits intellectually of the Indian Ocean world, because despite this two-volume, 400-page account from the 1930s of Japan, the richest work of Urdu Japanology, including even here Japanese interacting with Urdu, rather than, let's say, uh, Zulu and Hamharic with Urdu, when we start to turn to the bibliography of the text, we realize that all of this Japanology was actually built upon English language sources, rather through than through any direct uh, learning of Japanese and a much deeper engagement. So then finding, in a sense, the, the breaking points of intellectual history and intellectual engagement and indeed of cosmopolitanism as much as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the vast horizons which the ocean often seems to, set, uh, to present. So I'll finish there, but I just wanted to, you know, kind of really, in a way, point to the empirical richness of these materials um, and enabling us, I think, to start to construct from bottom up an Indian Ocean history that takes us from voiceless subalterns, perhaps, to the realm of vernacular savants. Thank you very much. So let me join my fellow panelists in thanking Dr. Abi Mershed and uh, Tarek and Susan and everyone else who was involved in making impeccable arrangements. And I would um, assume that any, anything involving the Oberoi name um, would have that excellence attached to it because as someone who grew up in Delhi in the early 1960s, that was the ultimate in sort of hospitality excellence to go to the one great Oberoi hotel that existed then at that time. Uh, now, of course, there are many, many more. So my work could just as easily be entitled Empire of Labor. And what one of its arguments is about the extent to which labor, uh, labor imperatives shape this vast empire that the British carved out across the Indian Ocean, um, a series of uh, islands that were key outposts, and of course the mainland of Burma, that served to tie the eastern part of the Indian Ocean to the, excuse me, the eastern part of the Indian Ocean to the western part of the Indian Ocean, leading all the way across the Bay of Bengal up to the Straits of Malacca, so to the point where the Indian Ocean meets the South and East China Sea. And I'll end with that point, too, because uh, today, of course, it has strategic importance in sort of Indian, Chinese, and US ideas of dominating that part of the world. So my work, which, which is a book which I hope to finish this summer, is about the way the British use transportation as a way of creating, uh, filling their labor needs across these outposts that they were creating across the Indian Ocean. And the criminals they were sending to these outposts 
were mostly people convicted of crimes they considered especially dangerous. Property crimes and collective crimes, the two kinds of things that threatened their law and order kind of project in India. And so India became this kind of sub-imperial center, to use a phrase that other scholars have used, or sort of a metropole from which Indians were transported, Indian convicts, but also political prisoners were sent to all these different outposts that, that the British had fashioned uh, in order to not only consolidate the empire in India, but also to establish these key commercial and military routes across the Indian Ocean. Uh, uh, this model follows what they had done earlier in, in North America. 52,000 to 60,000 people they transported to North America in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it sort of stops with the War of Independence. And about the same time that they are beginning their project in Australia, where over 166,000 people will be sent, they are also starting to send people from India in a very systematic way. Uh, my book doesn't deal with this, but there's also a return traffic of Chinese and Malays that they're sending to India and to Burma and to the Andamans. Unfortunately, because these are truly uh, people at the subaltern uh, level, there is not a single written account, unlike the kinds of people that God of Nile are talking about, left by any convict. So I've mostly had to work through a number of different kinds of sources to get any kind of voices, uh, to get any sense of what their experiences were like. Uh, my book focuses on sort of three sites in particular, all in Southeast Asia. The first is Benkulu in West Sumatra that the British acquire very early on and uh, give up to the Dutch after the 1824 peace treaty. Uh, until then, they sent large numbers of convicts there from, from uh, all over India. Um, uh, the second sort of case study is of Penang, which they're anxious to develop in kind of into a naval depot that will sort of enable them to control the Straits of Malacca and enable them to control both commerce as well as uh, against the VOC and other European rivals, uh, the Indian Ocean. And then the last sort of study is based in Singapore, which the British acquire in uh, 18. 19. So um, the, the idea behind using transportation was that it was a, a punishment that had a particular cultural valence in India, that it was culturally transgressive because there were large numbers of Indians, obviously not all Indians, because plenty of coastal Indians were very familiar with crossing what was known as Kalapani, or the Black Waters, because of course there were fisher folks and people who were actively involved and commerce who plied the waters of the Indian Ocean and had been doing it for thousands of years, as we know from Kian Chaudhry's magisterial work on the Indian Ocean. But there were large numbers of people from very early on. You see this already in petitions written in the 1780s and 1770s, when Indian soldiers who were used in Madras against the French, when they were sent back to North India by, by a ship, they sent petitions to the British asking, asking the British to help them, because when they went back to their villages in uh, today's UP and Bihar, they were ostracized because they were mostly of high caste. So it wasn't entirely a fiction that to a lot of people being sent across the black waters was a punish punishment particularly dreaded. And the British used this sort of dread that many people had to make this the mo second most severe punishment after, uh, the, after capital punishment. And they sort of relied on this kind of culturally transgressive nature of this punishment to terrify people against this punishment. So in the Benkulu case, I follow the story of three brothers who, whose surname is Khan, so Khan brothers, Muslims, who were transported from Banaras in the 1780s and found themselves in Benkulu in 1790s. 
And because they had formerly been soldiers in the employ of a lesser Mughal nobility, they were men of, they were sort of uh, warriors who were very adept in sort of sword play. And within a few years, these, these three Khan brothers, and one of them in particular, ends up becoming known as the Sahib of Benkulu. So not only the master of his fellow convicts, but also of the Indian regiments stationed there. And really the money lender par excellence in this local community with a Malay wife, with a local slave, with two houses, with riches galore in his bungalow. And the only reason that I know a lot about him is, is uh, one, of, one of his slaves turns against, against him and turns witness against him, and so there's a long court case involving him. My story of Penang is centered around 73 political prisoners who were exiled from South India at the beginning of the 19th century, known as the 73 Polygars. They're very, very famous in South India. They're heroes, and if you know, if you know your Tamil cinema, there are any number of films starting with Shivaji Ganeshan playing these, oh, okay, playing these, these uh, heroic figures. But 73 of them, according to Indian historians, disappear from history because they're put on a ship and they're never heard of again. Well, because they end up in Penang, I actually know a lot about them and uh, find out what happens to them over the next decade and a half when they're stuck in this island. And because their, their acts involved rebellion, political rebellion, they were not allowed to return. And then the third is of Singapore, which becomes British in 1819. And there it's both a mix of political prisoners as well as garden variety criminals who are sent there. And in all three cases, uh, a lot of my work is centered on the kind of work these convicts are involved in. Not the political prisoners, but the rank and file convicts. They end up building uh, every bridge, every road, every wharf, every jetty, every church, every office building. So much of Singapore, everything built in Singapore until the late 19th century is largely built by Indian convicts who are brought in because as the slave trade is ending in this part of Southeast Asia in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, there's an urgent plea made to authorities in Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. Please send us your convicts. We can use uh, any numbers of convicts you can send. And could you make sure there's some bricklayers and masons and carpenters in these, among these convicts so that they can do the kind of work that was so critical to building the infrastructure of empire across uh, these three outposts. And both Penang and Singapore are critical because they are seen as these vital entrepots, not only for the China trade, but also to secure uh, military communication across this part of the world. In the case of Singapore, much of my story is centered around, again, uh, you sort of have to follow whatever archival traces exist in order to build up any portrait, any sort of human stories centered in these penal sites. So my story of, of uh, Singapore is largely the story of these two Sikh rebels who are sent after the Second Anglo-Sikh War in late 1840s to Singapore, and one of the, one of the political prisoners sent there is this na man named Bhai Marad Singh, the last holdout in the war against the British, a much respected re religious figure. And the whole idea behind not executing him but sending him to Singapore is to make him completely disappear and cast him into oblivion. And to a certain extent, he does. But in the 20th century and today, he, of course, is one of the most important sort of religious figures in the diasporic Sikh community. As in his time, so to today, he is the guru, not the guru, excuse me, that's not a word you can use in that faith. He is the bhai, he is the Maharaj Singh. You can turn to in his Gurdwara in Singapore is the place you go to if you want to be successful in your exams or you want to have a son instead of a daughter. Because as he was in the 1840s, uh, 
the dispenser, the giver of all your boons. Because he was famous not only for leading the Sikhs against the British, but he was also the person who could produce any number of armed men, horses, swords, weapons, whatever you needed. Uh, and Bhai Maharaj Singh dies in sort of relative oblivion, but by the beginning of the 20th century becomes a much venerated figure. Initially worshipped by uh, uh, Tamil migrants who were the sort of the next wave of Indians who went there, then picked up by uh, Indian Muslims, and then eventually discovered by the Sikhs as one of their own. Uh, and so the book is is about this empire of convicts because ev all subject people to some extent were were depraved, uncivilized criminal. But the British were very selective about the kinds of people they considered so dangerous that they banished them overseas. And in their imagination, as well as in the self-perception of the people who were so banished, the British sort of treated them as convict workers. And they themselves thought of themselves as convict workers because they never used any terms to describe themselves as criminals. They didn't even use what, what would have been the logical Hindi Urdu word to use for themselves, bandwars, but they described themselves as company ke nokar, servants of the company, because of course this is during the period of the East India Company. And not surprising at all that the, the the term they used to describe what they were doing in Southeast Asia and across the Indian Ocean was the same term that similar kinds of people who joined the East India Company military thought they were doing, Nakri on behalf of the East India Company. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you.